Why were they obsessed with the movement of planets and stars and the moon and the sun? Because those were the cycles that the Maya tied their existence to. Their hope was to be able to use their knowledge of the past to guide the future. That's what the Maya calendar means. Well, thank you all for coming out this evening. And I'm pretty sure that there aren't many people this year who haven't heard about the ancient Maya, who haven't heard about their calendar, um, and haven't heard that they predicted the end of the world in just a few weeks' time. So if you've come out tonight, and this is weighing heavily <laughs> upon your minds, fret not, I intend to send you home reassured. Now, all too often, when we think of lost civilizations like the Maya, we think of them as very different from us, distant, foreign, even alien. <laughs> but tonight, I hope to reintroduce you to the Maya, to bring you into their lives through their history, to share with you their passions um, through their art. In essence, I would like to take you on a journey sort of back in time uh, together. And as is the hope with any travel to a little known place, when we arrive back home, our hope is that we better understand the place we visited and we also understand ourselves and where we've come from a little bit better as well. Now, this is Ian Graham. And this is just Ian on a normal day. You know, Ian, probably one of the most fascinating people ever to be born, took up the call. He sort of followed in the footsteps of people like Morley and Maudsley, documenting these ruins and these monuments in the forests of Guatemala and Mexico. And he became prominent in the 1970s because when he was out there doing it, he was battling looters he was dodging bullets. He was doing all of the things that those sort of fictional archaeologists do in movies. That's what Ian had to do in real life. And we even have the photograph of him with his whip. So we're just saying, Ian Graham, the real Indiana Jones. Well, Ian began a project called the Corpus of Maya Hieroglyphic Inscriptions. And Ian actually received a MacArthur Genius Award for his contributions to the decipherment of Maya hieroglyphs, not because Ian himself could read Maya hieroglyphs or decipher them at all, but because his life has been dedicated to simply recording these monuments before they vanished into the hands of private collections and looters around the world. That by documenting them, before they were lost, he actually provided the corpus of material that epigraphers would use to decipher Maya hieroglyphs. And it's only because of that work that today we can read about 90% of what we find, of what the Maya wrote. Now, I should say that when I began studying the Maya, we were really just beginning to unravel that history. I should also say that I wanted to be Ian Graham. I eventually did get the chance to work for Ian Graham. I was simply going out to verify the presence of a couple of monuments that Ian had found decades earlier and had reburied so that looters wouldn't find them. My job was simply to go out and re-find them, to go where he had already been, to find what he had already found. Um, I wasn't very good at it. Uh, I began at Ian's house. The first thing I was told by the guide he told me to hire was that, oh, we can't get there. It's just too far away. There is, however, a place that's very close. Um, we'd simply travel up through Tikal and through Washaktun. And from Washaktun, it's really just about a three-hour trip. There are these hieroglyphic monuments, three of them, in fact, that have recently been uncovered by looting, and we will go and find them, document them, you can take pictures. We'll be back later today. 
This is the road to Shultun that we took. It's in fact a very nice part of the road. It's the part where the road opens up and I think, hey, I think I can get a picture here. Um, we of course happened not long after that picture upon a tree fallen in the forest. I'm pretty sure it made a sound. <laughs> now, this is, I love this picture. Um, I love this picture because this is the crew that we had. It was myself, a few other individuals. Uh, we had two machetes and a chain. Um, a chainsaw probably would have been more useful in this case, but a chain is what we had. And we thought, you know what we'll do? We'll just use the vehicle and we'll haul this tree. Well, unfortunately, we also weren't driving a semi-trailer uh, or a bulldozer, so uh, we were unable to move that tree. But I mean, really, what are the chances we'd find another one? I mean, we just cut a path around the tree, we drove around it, should be fine. How many trees do you think we found? Okay, well, more than one. 18 is actually the winner. 18 is the winning number. 18 trees, 12 and a half hours. Uh, we eventually arrive at Shultun. We spend the night there. Um, the next day, we continue walking on our way. We eventually find the site of San Bartolo. We eventually find an archaeological site. I head out of the sun into a looter's excavation and get to see this. It's incredible to, to look at, the, the artistry of it. The last time a wall painting had been found in the Maya area was in 1946. It had been 55 years. I certainly had not found any of the things that Ian had sent me out to find, but I had gotten very lucky. And the perseverance of continuing to walk was rewarded by finding this. And I got very lucky in that I didn't have to go home empty-handed and that I didn't die. Um, also a bonus. These are the paintings at San Bartolo. The story itself is remarkable. The quality of the painting is stunning. The story tells us of a patron deity of kings that sets up the world, that makes a sacrifice of his own blood and of a series of animals at four trees representing the four corners of the world. And he does that in order to set up the world that kings will one day rule. Where kings will sit upon scaffolding and will receive their headdresses from attendants climbing ladders. These are the divine foundations of kingship and the ceremonies associated with the coronation of kings that would exist in the Maya lowlands for the next thousand years. And they are painted on the walls at San Bartolo in the first century BC. Now, this one comes from a student of mine, actually, Max Chamberlain, who the very day I finished the 10 years of work to consolidate and protect the San Bartolo murals, the day the last stone of that consolidation work went into place. This is the mural that Max found. Now you're looking at it, it's going, okay, you may be thinking the same thing I was thinking. <laughs> nice mural, Max. <laughs> I'm like, I'm no mural snob, but okay, fine, I'm a mural snob. I mean, it's very impressive, I, I think I see a line there. <laughs> well done, well done you. This is not something I'll have to worry about. I'm glad that you found it. He found it, decided to take what he called the Saturno method. I'll just poke my head around looters' excavations until I find a mural. I'm like, that is never gonna work again. And he's like, it did, it worked fine. Now, what's interesting is I said, well, Max, you know, it's disappointing, there's not much we can see, but certainly um, I'm surprised that there's anything here at all. This, in fact, wasn't a temple, this was a house. This actually wasn't even a terribly impressive house. The buildings themselves are just, uh, it's, it's a small mound, it's a few meters tall. You can see that it's right below the surface. Well, first of all, painting shouldn't be preserved here. It's not that the Maya didn't paint murals. They probably painted them all over the place. It's that they don't preserve in the Maya lowlands. Those changes in temperature and humidity are horrible for plaster and paint. They destroy them. And that little bit that was exposed by looters, we don't know how long it was exposed, but we know that at this point, uh, there was more mural there than I had imagined. I said to Max, well, I'm going to excavate just a little bit. 
We'll just see how big the room was. Certainly there's not going to be anything there, but at least we can say that it used to be this big. You know, there's no painting now, but there used to be something. So we excavated, and I excavated just a little bit. And that's the back wall of the room that you see through the looter's tunnel. It was only about 20 centimeters from where the looters had stopped. I excavated it, and I thought, holy cow, Max. <laughs> Bye, Joe, you've done it. Awesome. <laughs> There's another mural. I thought I was out. They keep dragging me back in. So, but this mural, so different than San Bartolo. One of the walls, the paint is almost invisible. It's very close to the surface. It's the exterior wall. It's on the east side. It's the wall that would have received the most light through the doorway when the room was in use. But on that wall, which you're looking at, you're saying, I'm not seeing a lot. We can still see some. We see an individual whose face painted black, his eye staring upwards. But more importantly on this wall is that there are these areas that are covered in Maya texts, some of them minuscule, some of them longer, but none of them containing the type of historical information that we might find on a stela, that we might expect to find on a classic period mural. In fact, the text that we see on this wall is really unlike any text that we've ever seen in the classic period. So I say to Max, well, not only did you find a painting, you found something unlike anything else we've ever seen. One of those paintings is this. It's fairly simple. It's a series of columns of Maya numbers. Each one of those columns is capped by a glyph of the moon. And in fact, the patron of the moon that applies to that particular six-month lunar period. This is a Maya lunar table. It's a series of days added upon days in order to precisely predict the moon's path through the sky. To precisely predict its period. Now I say that because it predicts the period of the moon so that it's off by about 20 seconds each year. Over a period of 13 years. This is simply the type of table that you would see in a Maya codex. This is the reconstructed table. It's really quite impressive. It's simply adding lunar months, lunar semesters, 177 days at a time. But like our leap year, every once in a while, every six periods, it adds an extra day as a correction in order to keep the mathematics of easily calculating the moon's period in line with the actual observations of the moon. Why did the Maya do this? Why were they obsessed with the movement of planets and stars and the moon and the sun? Because those were the cycles of their lives. Those were the cycles that they tied their existence to, that they tied the events of their daily lives and the events in the royal lives of kings. On the back wall of this room, even better preserved and more impressive, we see the portrait of a king. We see the king attended by an individual who is titled as the younger brother of Sidian, Itzin Tach. Doesn't make a lot of sense, the title, but I'll come back to that in a moment. All of the individuals in this room bear that title, the Obsidians, the brothers Tach. On this wall, we see another one of these tables, a table, again, of a series of numbers, bars and dots and zeros that sum up Maya cycles of time that combine mathematically all of the cycles they thought were important, whether that was the 260-day cycle of the ceremonial year based upon the period of human gestation, tying themselves into the calendar system, whether it was the 365-day solar year or the combination of those two, a period of 18,980 days, or whether it was the 584-day cycle of Venus, or the 780-day cycle of Mars, or the 117-day cycle of Mercury. Some of you have fallen asleep in the back, and my apologies. Now, if those numbers mean anything to you, they mean, I don't know enough about numbers, 
right? This is a room where these things were being figured out. Each one of these four numbers can be factored by all of the numbers I just told you. It's like a math problem. This is about a room full of people, a room full of guys getting together and figuring out, unlocking the keys to the universe. This is no different than our physicists looking for a God particle. This is them trying to understand how they fit in, how their lives can be tied to the cycles, large and small, that they can observe and predict around them. That's what the Maya calendar is. That's what the Maya calendar means. The numbers that we see in play here, the one, one of them, 17 baktuns. It projects thousands of years. If it's projecting from the base date, it's well into the future. If it's projecting from our date in the past, from a previous creation, it still makes its way beyond the date that we're recently approaching. The Maya didn't have a sense of time coming to an end. They had a sense of themselves involved with the cycles of time around them. For those of you that want to see what a codex looks like, this is the Dresden. The tables that I've just shown you could have been taken directly from this book, except that this book was painted 500 years at a minimum after those walls. Now, what's really remarkable about those walls is they were painted over and over again. They're blackboards. This isn't something that's permanent, right? This isn't a text to endure for the ages. This is a table to be used. This is a table to be replaced. It's a table to be effaced and redrawn, repainted, in much the way that the codices were corrected. Now, who were these guys? Who are these people? Who lived in this space? Who used this space? We saw Itzin Tach, young brother Obsidian. We saw him on the one wall. But who else? Let's look at the other wall. On this wall, we see much like that one face that we could see on the east wall. We now see three figures, all painted in black. Three figures wearing loincloths. The largest of those figures is named Sahuntach, senior obsidian, older brother obsidian, one of these brother obsidians, the, the brothers Tach. We see these characters, and it doesn't look like a Maya court scene, a scene in which everyone appears before the king dressed in their finery. These guys are in loincloths. They wear only two medallions, one on their chest, one in their headdress, a single feather, all painted in black like the night sky. These are our scholars. The one that we saw on the other wall with a single medallion on his chest, he's the youthful one. He's the one in training. He's also the one closest to the king. It's entirely possible that they are even related. This is part of a story that we're just now imagining could exist in the Maya Lowland. Because until the discovery of this painting, we had no idea that we would ever see anything like this. Not just the art, but the science behind it. Now, for those that are concerned that the calendar is ending, I'll just say a few words. Um, this is the Maya long count. This is actually today's date in the Maya long count. The date is 12, 19, 19, 16, 18. Each of those numbers represents a period of time. 18 days, the kin, the most basic unit of time. The sun rises, the sun sets, it rises again. One kin. The next digit, 16. Groups of 20. We like to count in tens. The Maya like 20s. We wear shoes. They didn't. It's very simple. 16, we now. 20-day periods, 19 360-day periods, 19 7,200-day periods, 12 144,000-day periods since 
the zero day, a particular day that we count forward from. It's also a day that we can count backward from. We can count into the past. Now, this day today happens to be 1,871,978 days since that day. Tomorrow, it continues to count. We get ever closer to approaching doom. <laughs> For some reason, our society is obsessed with groups of zeros. Nothing is more terrifying to us than <laughs> zeros grouped together, like a gang of them. What will they do? What if there are more of them? In 2000, there were three zeros. Now, in the Maya calendar, there are four. That's all. What happens after this day, 1,872,000 days after day one? What would happen for the ancient Maya, what they talked about, was that period endings, in general, were days that were important. In the same way that we might look forward to a big number on the odometer in our car, that we might say, I'm almost to 10,000 miles. I'm totally going to watch. <laughs> I'm going to watch it until it switches over to 10,000 miles. Oh, what's that? Damn it! <laughs> None of us probably think that at 100,000 miles that the car will vanish. <laughs> we don't think to ourselves, I hope I'm close to home when I hit 100,000 miles because this baby's going to disappear and I'm going to have to walk. Right? It's a monumental occasion. It's momentous. We look at it and we say, that would be awesome. But exactly like that odometer, what happens at this big unit of time? What takes place? What if you miss it? <laughs> that's an awfully long wait to see it go by again. And that's the reason it was important. That's the reason that this ending, the 130000 date, was recorded a couple of times during the classic period because the people that recorded it were looking forward in time to the largest change in the calendar they could imagine. That's how the Maya thought of time. They thought of themselves being just a tiny bit in the middle of an enormous expanse of time that extended into the past and extended into the future. Their hope was to be able to use their knowledge of the past to guide the future. That's certainly our hope. That's why we look to the Maya. We think, maybe they know more about this stuff than we do. Maybe they do. The important thing here is that when we look to the Maya, we have to know that we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at people like us. We're not looking at an alien race with some special knowledge of the universe. We're looking at a group of human beings that we're trying to figure out how they fit in. That's who we are. When we meet the Maya on our time travel, we should be greeting them not as strangers, not as foreigners unknown to us, but we should be looking at them like friends, long lost friends that have a really kind of interesting view of sacrifice. But nonetheless, <laughs> they're us and we're them. And we seem to be obsessed with the end of time. But they were only obsessed with calculating the continuation of time. Have a good night.